Hey guys, it's Rob from Civil Advantage Firearms Training here. Uh, welcome to the first video in our new series, which is Civil Advantage Gun Talk. So let me tell you a little bit about what this format is. Um, what I've wanted to do for some time is I've wanted to get guests in the studio that know a lot more than I do about a particular firearm or a firearms related subject. So I can pass, I can capture and pass on that wisdom to, uh, to everyone else. Um, that's been a real challenge because my schedule is inhuman at best. I mean, I'm crazy, crazy busy doing a lot of different stuff. And, um, and so is everyone else. Everyone's you know running around like crazy, uh, you know, working their butts off trying to make a living. So it's been really difficult to get people into the studio, into that formal environment to, uh, to share their experience with us. So what I thought, uh, what I thought I'd do is do a series of phone interviews, um, with these folks. And, uh, that's what this video is going to be all about. So first thing, well, I got a couple of things I want to talk to you guys about before we get into this particular one. First thing is I really need you guys to let me know, comment, let me know if these videos are too long. Um, if there's too much detail, if they're boring, you know, give me your opinion on it because, you know, I don't want to do a bunch of these if, uh, if you guys aren't getting value out of it, but keep in mind exactly what this video is. These videos are the details. So it's everything you ever wanted to know about this particular firearm. If you want a lot more detail than my normal videos, this is where you go for it. So hopefully they will have kind of a radio show feel to them so that you can, you know, just let turn this on and let it play while you're cleaning your gun room or whatever, or cleaning guns, which is what I like to do when I listen to uh, audio based, uh, you know, YouTube videos. So in any case, yeah, let me know what you think about that. Uh, the other thing is I would like to appeal for some help from you guys. Um, what I'd like to do is if any of you guys have, uh, experience or expertise as far as how to set up recording phone calls using this mic that I'm talking on now, which sounds a lot better than a phone. And then the, the caller, uh, on the line as well. Uh, I don't know how to do that. So if you guys know how to do that properly, um, please let me know, shoot me a call or, uh, or send me an email. You guys have my contact information. It's all on, uh, on the website, www.civiladvantage.com. And uh, if you can help me out with that, I greatly appreciate it. So today's call is gonna be about the Tavor. Now, as you guys know, I did a video about the Tavor. Um, I shot uh, the Tavor on a couple of different occasions. Great rifle, but I am by no means the absolute expert. I just take information from other people, summarize it, mix it with what I know, and that's what I present. So the guy that actually owns that Tavor that I shot in the video, his name is Claude, and we're gonna call him CF Claude. And we're gonna call him that because he's ex-Canadian Forces, and uh, he's just a hell of a guy. I mean, this guy knows everything about the guns that he's familiar with. And uh, he's a fantastic resource, certainly for me. So um, that's about it. So let's get to the call. Pros and cons. Yeah, pros is um, obviously uh, non-restricted, uh, being a Canadian owner, etc. Mm -hmm. um, a non-restricted battle rifle, essentially, is what it boils down to. And those are, those are tough to come by, um, obviously. Unless you get the extended barrel, um, feed your uh, CSA, or I shouldn't say CSA, but um, um, VZ858, the, or, a, uh, or an M305 clone of the M14. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a great piece of kit. It, uh, it's short. It's non-restricted. It's 223 or slash 556, uh, which is a, um, is a benefit if you're looking to, uh, to run AR magazines in your platform. Uh, not so much if you're looking to keep your ammo costs down. Um, cons is obviously the cost. I mean, that, uh, that three grand after tax, it's, uh, it's a bit of a hit, even the ones that you can find, um, currently. Which are a modified version with a uh, with a long Picatinny rail and uh, no Metro sight. Uh, those are twenty seven hundred. So by the time taxes and ship, you know you're up around the three grand mark. And the only reason I was able to afford mine was uh, I got in on the first batch. So it was the three easy payments of thousand bucks a month. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. 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 I mean, if it, if it wasn't for that, there was no way that I would have been able to uh, pick one up. Um, if as a uh, as a standard issue um, uh, main battle rifle for the Israeli Army, obviously, I mean, if they um, if a coup they actually have one. What it is though is certainly a 
change for those who have been brought up on the AR platform. And it's a completely different manual of arms, and virtually nothing ports from um, from an AR platform to the Tavor platform. Uh, it's a whole new learning curve, it's a whole new set of uh, set of skills, it's a whole new batch of muscle memory. So if you have a lot of ARs and you're looking at getting into uh, into the Tavor, uh, you're going to struggle with it. It uh, it's not a if you raised on the AR platform, it's not intuitive. It's um, it's different, and it's different for a reason. The um, it's it's more effective in my personal opinion. I grew up on the uh, on the FN platform, uh, which actually has a lot more in common with the uh, with the support platform than the uh, than the AR platform. Hmm. Uh, from the F- for my uh, 223 platform, the Tavor is certainly the uh, the way to go. And a lot of um, a lot of hardcore AR guys, particularly when you get guys coming up from the states that want to shoot the Tavor because they can't get it down there unless they go to Israel, they don't even chance to shoot it. They come up here, they shoot it off, and they don't like it. It's, it's, it's not, it's not conducive to their to their muscle memory. So they're ambivalent towards it, and that um, you know it should be introduced into the state. That's certainly something that um, something to be overcome. Um, but myself, I love it. It's um, I'm not a big AR guy. Um, I moved from the uh, from the AR platform to the CZ BZ platform, and I don't have any issues running the Tavor. I've actually got more problems getting transition back to the AR platform. Hmm. So, uh, in the in the manual of arms uh, for the Tavor, uh, a couple of a um, couple of things that are really different about it is mag changes, obviously, and uh, bolt lockback and bolt manipulation, with the controls primarily behind the uh, behind the firing hand, so the uh, side from the charging handle, which is uh, typically above the support handle or force top. It's, it's different to run. Um, the gun doesn't like P-mags. Uh, P-mags will not drop free uh, until they're really worn in. Uh, but it loves metal mags. Uh, virtually any brand of metal mag will drop free in the in the system, which depending on how you want to run your mag change. Uh, if you're running it with retention, having a sticky mag is a good thing in that uh, it's not a big deal. You can come up, remove the magazine into the dump pouch, and stuff. If, but if you're uh, if you're into the combat reload and you want that mag out of the well, um, flipping the hand back. Hit that mag release, drop the mag, and slam in the new one. The support hand is uh, it's got large hands. It's easy to do without really losing your, uh, your firing grip. A um, couple other things that are different in the uh, in the manual of arms. Although um, a lot of guys have a have a thing with bull pups and um, support side shooting. If not, ooh, I'm going to eat grass because the ejection port is so far back, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Um, well, you, you know the way that I train is um, if I'm not getting half of my rounds strong side, half of my rounds support side, then I'm not the training. So I do a lot of support half shooting with the uh, with the Tavor, and I've only uh, I've only eaten grass once, and that was uh, that was when I first started out. It's just a matter of making sure that you're your cheek weld is consistent, uh, or your at least your head position is consistent on the platform, regardless of your position. One of the more challenging positions is um, support side urban prone. Yeah, if you're going to eat brass, that's going to be the one that you're going to eat it in. And um, I haven't had any issues at all since uh, I initially started with the platform over that. Hmm. Well, you know what? I don't remember. Does it does it eject um, forward or just straight uh, straight to the side? 
it, it does eject forward. Um, it's uh, it's not a lot of forward ejection, but it is uh, it is a bit, and it is enough to um, to clear your head position in support side shooting. It it's just not it's just not an issue. Awesome. And now, are you aware of what's required to turn that thing uh, to um, to go to left-handed operation with that? Like what parts you need? It's uh, it is essentially just a uh, a bolt handle. Uh, or a, um, uh, it is a left-handed bolt that's required, but everything else just changes over, essentially. It's all on platform. Uh-huh. If memory serves me correctly, it's not something that I've really, uh, I've really looked at, but I think it is, it is one part that you need to purchase separately, and that is the, uh, that is the bolt. Okay, so it's, because I think oh. someone, yeah, I think someone had posted that it's not as, as simple as, you know, moving the charging handle over and then, you know, oh. slide and close <laughs> the ejection port and slide and open the other one. Oh, it, it is, and it does require, I believe it is a, a separate left hand bolt. Okay, well, I'm sure that's a few hundred bucks, right? Oh, yeah, easy, if uh, if you can get the bits and pieces. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, support for the uh, for the thing is uh, is challenging. Um, one of the big parts is that um, not really a whole lot breaks on these things, so it, it's not really an issue. I can't think of anybody that's really had a whole lot of issues with their uh, with its core. Mm-hmm. Well, that would be my main concern with any exotic, and I would consider that an exotic rifle, but that's always my main concern, and that's always one of the big things that I always throw up as far as, you know, why I think ARs are, are you know, such a smart choice because, you know, you can't swing a dead cat on the street without hitting someone that's got some AR parts. Oh, absolutely, 100% correct, and, uh, but that's provided that you swing that AR on a range. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> that is provided you swing that AR on a range. Yeah. I'm not out on the bush. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, the non-restricted thing, well, the two things that I like and is, is that it, yeah, it is non-restricted, but it is short. So the one thing I was complaining about on the XCR review was that even though it's non-restricted and super expensive, though, which is the, the downside for the XCR in Canada, certainly, um, is that with that, by the time you, you take in consideration that flash hider, it's 20-inch barrel, that starts its 20 inches at the end of the chamber, which is still, you know, a good, what, 12 inches away from your shoulder. So when you single point sling that thing, um, you know, it's going to be banging on your ankles, at least for somebody my height. It's going to be banging around on my ankles, and that doesn't really, yeah, I don't like that. Yeah, no, yeah. absolutely, and that, uh, that is correct. And, I mean, with this, uh, this thing is actually as short, as my ten and a half inch AR with an M4 stock fully collapsed on it. See, that's pretty cool. So, and this thing is the same size as an eight and a half inch barrel running from 870 with an M4 stock fully collapsed on it as well. And I actually side by side compared them um, today. This uh, the Caltech RFB in 7.62 by 30, or by, uh, by 51 is actually about two inches shorter than the Tavor, but still non-restricted. Huh. How, how long is the Tavor overall length? Do you know? Uh, Offhand? Precisely, 74.5 centimeters in length. Huh. That doesn't help me. I'm a little more imperial. <laughs> is there, is there, I got a tape measure here somewhere. <laughs> oh, you don't have to measure it now, man. Um, what's that? Sorry, Claude. Thought I had a tape measure here. But I, yeah, not a big deal. Well, I, I've I've always got a tape measure handy in the uh, bedside drawer. So um, yeah, yeah. But there you go. Anyhow, <laughs> different yeah, story. So you, can, so you can prove to the wife that it's, you're not lying, right? Exactly. I don't want nobody makes a liar to me. But uh anyways. But yeah, as I as I mentioned before, we started talking about the Tavor that the I mean things might be different now, but the the MSRP in the US when they start coming in, uh, should they come in, it's supposed to be around sixteen hundred bucks, which is a lot more reasonable, which is actually a lot closer to where the X C R is in the US, you know. Right. And, and the X C R is double that. Well, twenty four hundred, twenty three, twenty three fifty. I guess you can get them. 
you know that's a it's just a it's a tough pill to swallow oh no it is and i'm not and like i said i mean the best price that uh, you're going to find right now and that's without an optic is uh 2700 bucks when you can find them up here and i think uh dead zombies uh has got one left in canada yeah well and people are running for them i mean there's a there's a little bit of rumblings that you know people are, are looking into what exactly is non-restricted up here which of course you can i mean a barrett 50 cal is non-restricted so <laughs> but god forbid i take that ar in the bush then all hell will break loose but, but exactly anyway yeah no it's a it's 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 a cool gun what about accuracy i mean uh it is a bullpup. It does have a long barrel, but I mean, have you ever tried to reach out a, a ways with it? Or oh yeah, no, absolutely. And it's um, one of the uh, one of the more challenging things with this uh, with this platform, uh, particularly in its uh, soft configuration. Um, the the newer configuration with the full length top Picatinny rail makes it a lot easier to get a uh, a decent optic setup on it. Um, First ones that came in obviously had the Mepro um, clamp type assembly attached to the barrel, and mm. guys just absolutely hated the uh, the Mepro site that came with it. I hate mine; it's a dead amoeba that's really tough to pick up and it's inaccurate as hell. Um, so looking at changing out that assembly with a rail that would uh, would clamp to the barrel. Uh, in a similar fashion was challenging. Um, a couple of local manufacturers stepped up. Um, I run one of the uh, one of the first uh, Picatinny short rails that was made to replace the um, the Mepro site in roughly the same configuration. And I've struggled through the years to mount something that was accurate on it. Um, I've tried various uh, variable powered optics on it. One and a half to five, one and a half to six, um, EOTech red dots, that sort of thing. Um, and I just haven't been able to achieve accuracy out to 500 that um, I've been able to achieve with either my XCR or uh, or the AR platform for that matter. Mm-hmm. And it's not so much the uh, – it's certainly not the rifle per se in that it, the rifle has a lot of inherent accuracy. And it's got good barrel length. Overall length is fine. Uh, the trigger is, um, is certainly not a match trigger by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but regardless, trigger manipulation is uh, is it nothing consistent. So while it might be a little bit more difficult to manage than a match trigger, it's certainly not beyond the realm of um, adversely impacting accuracy. I think a lot of it has to do with the high uh, bore offset that, um, based on the conventional configuration, and you're almost uh, three and a half, four inches from center of optic to center of barrel, and it's um, it's difficult. I've shot uh, I've shot a lot of tactical courses with things, uh, and out to 100 accuracy is fine, not a big issue. I've shot the thing in service rifle conditions back to 500 with the PCRA, and that's problematic for me. I've always started the season with the uh, with the Tavor, and about halfway through, I've had to revert back to uh, to my XCR because the numbers are just not where I need them to be with the Tavor platform. And I think it's a combination of both um, me and trigger manipulation, as well as coming up with the right optical setup, if you like. Mm-hmm. There's a number of um, there's a number of aftermarket assemblies that are uh, are available for the uh, Tavor that are locally manufactured in Canada. Uh, one is made by uh, Sean Roche of Roche Tactical. Uh, I have one of his four and sitting uh, in my closet that I haven't installed. I know a couple of guys that have them mounted and are happy with them. Um, the last used to uh, used to make a slightly longer rail. That would uh, that would work on the uh, on the platform, um, but not uh, not so much anymore. There's a, and there's a couple of other uh, aftermarket ones that I find that were pretty front end uh, when it first came out here. But it's uh, it's a challenging platform to 
in my opinion, to get to perform accurately at long range. And I think a lot of it has to do with overcoming both the inherent um, AR ARness, if you like, that uh, that guys are used to. Mm -hmm. It's easy enough to tune your AR trigger to um, be precisely where you want it to be. And it is a gas system, um, not direct infringement, obviously a gas piston system, so it is slightly more inaccurate than a direct gas infringement system. Um, but really that doesn't have or shouldn't have a whole lot of effect on the uh, on the overall long range accuracy of this part. Interesting. Okay, but I mean for, for for people you know, for people like me if I hit something at a hundred, you know, I'm kissing my biceps or <laughs> Hitting at 100 is certainly not an issue. Uh, I've got a new uh, a new setup on uh, on my shorter rail right now that uh, I haven't had a chance to shoot yet. I just picked up a um, a Neotech uh, XPS uh, with a magnifier behind it now. Um, before we said uh, before the XPS came out, you couldn't really get a Neotech on the rail with a magnifier. Mm -hmm. uh, that's since changed, so I'm I'm looking forward to uh, to shooting the current setup out to um, out to, out to 500 actually this uh, this season. Yeah, uh, just to see what it's what this version is capable of. Hmm. But do you think that uh, do you think two or three hundred is is uh, you know? Oh, absolutely. That that is that is more than uh, this thing is more than capable of producing. Um, Producing at least two MOA out to uh, out to 200 with an inex with an inexperienced operator behind the uh, behind the trigger, and mm -hmm. because it is a, such a strange manual of arms, don't kid yourself. Everybody is inexperienced in this unless you've gone through IDF basic training, really, because because it is entirely different than your AR platform, and there is nothing that ports over, coiling right next to your face and the whiff of um, Burn propellant that you get that discharges directly into your nostrils and makes your eyes water. I mean, all that is part of learning to run the system. You know, if I were to, to sum it up, I mean, there's no reason not to have total respect for that rifle um, as far as a fighting rifle is concerned, uh, other Absolutely. than the price. Other than the price. Absolutely not. And, and even with the price, I mean, uh, when you could, like you said, when you do compare it to uh, to a, an XCR, non restricted. Or for that matter, for a uh, if you were to go out and to, uh, to try and obtain a, a Springfield Armory M14, then yeah, I mean the thing is uh, the thing is price comparable. Well, the Springfield Armory and M14, I mean the M14 is is, well, I mean, good God, man, it's probably 11 pounds. So oh, absolutely, yeah. And still, I mean, regardless, it, it is still a main battle rifle. It just happens to be a larger caliber. Uh, sling options. Sling options. That's a that's another good yeah. thing to chat about. Always um, with the uh, with the assembly that comes with the rifle, um, for just a basic carry it from here to there assembly where you need to lace the thing up. It is fine. Uh, when you get into more moving and grooving with the thing, it's not something that that really lends itself to either. Uh, Changing the platform into a single sling or into a single point sling, um, which is the way this thing really likes to be run because it is so short. So running a single point um, for for your CQB is not an issue at all. Mm -hmm. um, and being able to uh, being able to transition it back to a uh, back to a two point when when you need those extended um, or when you're in a more conventional scenario it is a bit challenging. And um, I've seen a number of different options out there, none that I've really been too happy with. And I'm working on one with a uh, Blue Force gear sling that uh, I think is going to work out quite well. It, um, I've just uh, I've just changed it up today, as a matter of fact, for a rapid uh, change from two point to uh, to single point, and I'm actually quite happy with the uh, with the way it's, uh, it's working out, and I plan on running it that way. Uh, End of the month when uh, when you do the uh, ATS shoot, how do that expert so. Huh. So right now, you have you got? Are you running a single point or running a uh, two point? Uh, well, I run uh, I run the Blue Force uh, SOCOM sling, and the nice thing about uh, Blue Force gear slings is that uh, they transition from one point to two point to just the click of a side release. But typically, so, uh, typically I do, I like running it uh, single point because of the. Um, 
Because of most of the shooting that I do is uh, 100 yards away, so single point is uh, is easy enough. If I'm going to be doing a lot of uh, a lot of moving and grooving, then I will switch it to a two point. Okay, interesting. So now, when when I shot it, um, when we were at the range there, um, I didn't use a sling, so I have no idea. If you have a single point sling, like we're just looking at the rifle, I would think that if that single point of uh, of contact with the, between the rifle and the sling, if it's too far forward, that rifle is going to tip up. Because right. of all that weight in the back, it, 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 it's actually uh, when it's rigged as a single point sling, it's rigged off of the uh, off of the rear hook point, and mm-hmm. that's the nice thing about the uh, the BFG sling setup in that it because it's a single point uh, or it's a side release multi component that I run on all my platforms. Mm-hmm. It's just a matter of hooking and side release and away it goes. Okay, but that would be that would be the point of connection. If uh, if you're only running a single point, is that one that's right at, right in the back of the action, right against the bus stop? Uh, right, it's uh, it's about three inches forward to the end of the bus stop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I've got a picture here, so that's interesting. Well, the, thank goodness that it's a bullpup because uh, if that was any other rifle, you know, contacting at that area, I mean, it would be uh, you'd be taking core samples every step with the barrel. <laughs> with the oh, yeah, absolutely. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, that's uh, that's interesting too. I remember the uh, the one day we did see uh, an individual with a uh, with a Tavor and and uh, with the muzzle pointing up just because it seemed like because it was so rear heavy. If yeah, you remember that, that day, that was a function of the uh, that was a function of the three point rig that um, that the the gun was slung in. Mm-hmm. And the thing really doesn't uh, doesn't like a three point setup. It's strictly it's strictly a, a single point or a two point. Yeah. And yeah, it, it doesn't like that midpoint scenario given the uh, given the overall mm-hmm. length of thing. It's really uh, it, it is because it's there's not a lot of conventional sling options for it. It's uh, it's tough to set it up the way that you the way that works for you to run the gun. And again, that that is one of the reasons that I like BFG uh, slings is because there's just so many different options and you've got so many different ways you can configure the connection point, you're, you're not limited uh, when, you, uh, when you get one. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's good stuff to know. The sling mounts, did they come on the rifle or did you have to buy them? So they actually come on the, the you, you actually can't mount additional sling mounts um, or aftermarket sling mounts on this thing. If you were to try to go, um, well, you really can't. There is no place to do it. Um, you're left with a um, you're left with one connection point that's about uh, two thirds of the way forward on the action, uh, plus the single uh, the single connection point right at the back end, which does not take a push button, even though it looks like it does. It doesn't. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, it's a um, it's a little bit of homegrown. Fabrication, if you like. I mean, the sling that comes through it is essentially a um, is a paracord based system for connection. You tie a big Jesus knot in your paracord on either side of the uh, the openings, and away you go. And <laughs> it, doesn't get, get much, it, it doesn't get much simpler than that. <laughs> <laughs> they took a cue from the Russians. Yeah, oh, yeah absolutely, one hundred percent. And then you, you, they attached a batch of paracord to a two-inch wide nylon sling that you could adjust for length, and there you go. Well, that's good. Keeping it simple is a good thing. Absolutely. I mean, it works. It absolutely works, one hundred percent. But if you're looking at um, if you're looking at a lot of dynamic action with your gun, where you're going to be looking at changing sling lengths and that sort of thing when you're transitioning to support side, all that sort of stuff, and you want to run, um, you either want to run a bungee sling or you want to run a, uh, a sling that's adjustable for length as you're moving, it's, it's tough to do because nobody makes them that simple. Again, I mean, it's the one that I've, I've, spent, I've got a lot of different slings, and the one system that I keep coming back to just because it works with every platform that I run, from from my shotguns all the way through my VZs, all the way through my M14s, my ARs, my F4, my XCR, this sling system will work with all of them, and as a minimum, I can change up components that will work with everything that I run. Good, uh, That's good info. Good info for anybody considering the rifle, for sure. Oh, yeah. Hey. A rifle without a sling is like a pistol without a holster, right? This is true. (laughs) 
so yeah. Any any uh, any other information you want to pass on about the Tavor? What else you got there? Uh, no, I think that's uh, that's pretty much it there, buddy. Awesome. Well, that's that's uh, no, that's that's all fantastic information. That's and and as I well, when I edit this down and, and put it into a file, as I would have announced before the conversation started, you know, there's just no way unless I owned this Tavor and you know run through courses with it for a year, I would I would ever know any of that stuff. So that's definitely uh, the purpose of of um, you know this conversation, which is a lot longer than any of the videos that I do, but well worth it for someone that's really interested in the Tavor and and uh, wants to know every every in and out of it. Um, if if we were in Canada, and I don't know if you've looked into it, if we were in Canada and you needed to source parts for it, I mean, what what the heck would you even do? Hmm. That would be a lot tougher uh, to, depending on which part it was. I mean, quite frankly, with no with no real service support for the thing, you'd be looking at uh, trying to find a um, a machinist or a gunsmith that would be able to manufacture the part for you. No, oh, God, man. Oh yeah, yeah, and but I mean that's that's you can say that about pretty much any of the exotic quote unquote guns that we get up here. Yeah, it's like Swiss Arms or or yeah, I mean, you know. your 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 Swiss Arms. What are you going to do? Send it back to Switzerland, or maybe try and ship it back down across the border for service there? Just ask anybody who's broken anything on an H and K, and what sort of nightmare that's turned out to be. So I, I can't, uh, I mean, I'm not aware, and I haven't seen anything from anybody in the various forums uh, or talking to personally that have broken anything, quote, unquote, on their Tavor to date. So I can't, I certainly can't say the same thing about um, about SIG arms or about h and Ks. Well, I'm trying to remember. I thought I saw a figure of how many Tavors there were in British Columbia, I think 350 or something. It wasn't a big number. Yeah. So it, it's not a big number. And uh, Canada overall, it's still not a big number. Yeah, well, that's that's a lot of cash. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it, it is. Absolutely, 100%. Probably the only thing holding it back. Yeah. Yeah. Because if I did some quick math, that's like, that's a, that's a million dollars. Yeah. A yep. million dollars worth of guns. Hmm. Interesting, and I don't think uh, I don't think this is it. I've probably asked you this before, but have you ever had um, a malfunction? Any double feeds or failure to extract? Any the usual? No, I haven't. Not uh, not one. Well, I have another gun that has that kind of record too, and it was a heck of a lot cheaper. Restricted though. <laughs> I'm not gonna. You know, we'll do a separate call about that manufacturer. I won't. I won't mix it in with this uh, elitist style uh, battle rifle because it's. Yeah, there you go. There but you go. Uh, <laughs> I think the, the tolerances are probably a little bit less uh, precise on my uh, on my other gun. Yeah. Than, but yeah. But in any case. Well, awesome. <laughs> Anything else that you're prepared to talk about today? Uh, I think that's about it, pal. Excellent. All right, I'll leave you with it for now. All right, pal. You have, you have uh, a good one. You too. Thanks again, Claude. Not a problem. All right. Take care. Talk to you. Bye. All right. Bye. So there you guys have it. Uh, thanks so much for listening today. Um, again, please comment. Let me know what you think of these videos and uh, and how I can improve them. And uh, uh, one uh, one more time, I'd like to appeal to uh, some of you guys out there that might know a little bit more about uh, uh, audio and, and recording and stuff than I do. Let me know how to record a call, the uh, you know radio show style. Uh, that'll really help me out. So Anyway, look, uh, look forward to the comments. Uh, hope you guys enjoyed it. Have a great day. Take care.